This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, U.S. President Joe Biden hosts his first state dinner honoring the president of America's, o of America's oldest ally, France. Families of January 6 defendants attended a fundraiser in Washington yesterday. We hear stories from defendants, their wives and supporters. The state of Florida is divesting assets from the investment management company BlackRock as over the company's push for environmental, social and governance standards or ESG. We have the details. After widespread protests in at least 19 cities beginning last Friday, China signaled it could soften its strict COVID lockdowns. But videos from China tell a different story. And a psychiatrist says by sharing his lessons battling depression, he hasn't lost one patient in 30 years. He shares some advice. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today's December 2nd. Happy Friday. And we're starting today with our top news. The potentially devastating railroad strike has been averted. The U.S. Senate passed a bill to avoid the shutdown yesterday. The House passed the bill on Wednesday with overwhelming bipartisan support. It separately approved seven days of paid sick leave. But that wasn't in the original agreement. That part of the deal was struck down in the Senate. It fell eight votes shy of the 60 needed. The bill binds rail companies and workers to a proposed settlement reached in September. The agreement includes a 24 percent pay increase over five years. It also includes five annual $1,000 lump sum payments. There are no paid short-term sick days in the deal. Unions asked for 15 during negotiations, and railroads settled on one personal day. President Biden praised the move, saying the country had been spared a Christmas catastrophe. He says he will sign the bill when it reaches his desk. U.S. President Joe Biden rolled out the red carpet on Thursday for celebrities, lawmakers, and titans of industry. This at a White House state dinner in honor of French President Emmanuel Macron. Viva la France and God bless America. Macron arrived in Washington on Tuesday for his second state visit to the United States since the French leader took office in 2017. During their toast at the dinner, the two presidents toasted their country's long-standing friendship and unity. We come from the same values. Macron espoused on democratic principles. We the people, we the people. He then spoke of Lafayette in the American Revolutionary War. He was the French aristocrat, Freemason and military officer who commanded American troops at the siege of Yorktown. He fought for these principles and to have people here living in democracy and freedom. And this is the same, the same thing in my country. However, critics of Macron have said that living in France during the COVID epidemic did not reflect those principles. France had some of the strictest COVID rules in Europe. People over 16 needed a vaccine pass requiring full boosters to legally use transport services and access public spaces, bars and restaurants. And all non-vaccinated healthcare workers lost their jobs. The dinner is the crowning social event of a trip aimed at showing Biden's commitment to Washington's oldest ally. The two countries are wrangling over how to handle Russia's war in Ukraine, subsidies for U.S. products and other issues. The president's son Hunter was in attendance as well as Kevin McCarthy, who leads a Republican congressional delegation that has vowed to investigate his business dealings. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Families of January 6th defendants attended a fundraiser in Washington yesterday. An open house gift drive was held to raise money for legal fees. Defendants called in from prison, wives expressed their feelings, and guest speakers showed their support. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on their circumstances. The event was hosted by the Patriot Freedom Project. The organization helps political prisoners and their families raise legal fees and strives to bring awareness to their plight. Guest speakers included Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Greene says when visiting January 6th defendants during a D.C. prison tour, she found the conditions deeply disturbing. 
She shared that many of the prisoners she met with told her they're denied medical treatment and from seeing their attorneys. An elderly guy, his whole arm was purple and they were refusing treatment for him and they were begging me to get help for him. Because of COVID restrictions, Green says they are made to go into solitary confinement for several days before being allowed to see attorneys. It's bad enough in the jail if you're a pretrial January 6th defendant, but if you're an unvaccinated pretrial January 6th defendant, you're on a whole new level. She says the unvaccinated are denied services like church and communion, as well as haircuts and other basic human rights. Defendants called in through their wives' phones to give brief statements. It's biblical that when the evil keeps attacking you, it's because you're doing something right. So keep fighting the good fight and helping the patriots of this great nation. The defendants' wives share their experiences and express their gratitude to those supporting them. My husband is Kyle Young, who has recently been tried and sentenced. He's currently serving a over seven-year sentence, and he will miss his children growing up. What they've done to us, what they're continuing to do to us, it's not fair, it's not right, and we need to stand up and fight, and we're going to. I'm trying to be a mother and a father. That's not what I signed up for. My husband's a good man. Patriot Freedom Project founder Cynthia Hughes says those involved are being politically persecuted and that the Biden administration is weaponizing the Department of Justice against their political opponents. So I'd like to ask Alex to please come forward. Conservative political consultant Alex Brusowitz says after donating to the Patriot Freedom Project, he was contacted by the January 6th committee. They don't talk to me for a year, but the day after I make a contribution to help you guys, Alex, come before the committee, we summon you. Brusowitz says they don't want family stories to get out and for people to support them, and that they try to intimidate and break those that do. He says that doesn't just apply to financial supporters, but also attorneys. After the 2020 election, the Justice Department, the media, they beat up on attorneys who wanted to take a look at election fraud. They said, you'll never work again in politics. Same exact situation is happening here with your family. So many attorneys, good attorneys, refuse to touch your cases. Steve Bannon and former President Trump showed their support by calling in. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The state of Florida is divesting $2 billion of assets from the investment management company BlackRock. This is over the company's push for environmental, social, and governance standards, or ESG. Florida Chief Financial Officer Jimmy Petronas announced Thursday that the Florida Treasury will immediately begin to freeze all securities and investments managed by BlackRock. This includes $1.4 billion worth of long-term securities and $600 million of short-term investments. Critics of ESG say it's a movement to advance a progressive political agenda. Petronas criticized BlackRock's push for ESG, saying, quote, It's undemocratic of major asset managers to use their power to influence societal outcomes. The Florida CFO says he doesn't believe BlackRock will deliver maximized returns and that the Florida Treasury will relocate the investments elsewhere. The Supreme Court next week will start hearing oral arguments on a case about First Amendment religious freedom. It's about a web designer in Colorado who is being forced to create sites that celebrate same-sex marriage. In this case, artist and website designer Lori Smith from 303 Creative is suing the Colorado Civil Rights Division. The state is is compelling her to produce a same-sex wedding website, and it's something she says goes against her Christian faith. In 2021, a federal appeals court ruled against the designer, and she appealed to the Supreme Court. Smith's attorneys say they are confident the high court will rule in their favor. One of them said, quote, We're very hopeful that the U.S. Supreme Court will affirm the right of all Americans to say what they believe without fear of government punishment. Back in 2018, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Christian baker in Colorado who refused to make a cake celebrating same-sex marriage. And now an update over from China. After widespread protests in at least 19 cities beginning last Friday, China signaled it could soften its strict COVID lockdowns. But new videos from China tell a different different story. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg reports. 
A video from Hangzhou City was posted December 1st. Workers in white hazmats are filmed taking a man by force to what they say is a quarantine camp. The person in the video said he tested negative for COVID and asks the workers the reason they are arresting him, but they refuse to explain. The video explains there are no documents provided for the arrest or any information about where they're taking him. Some Chinese netizens commented on Weibo, a Chinese app similar to Twitter, pointing out that authorities didn't show documents and therefore anyone could put on a white suit and kidnap people. Another person said, what if they kidnap you and sell your organs? Nobody will know. A similar situation was shared by another netizen in the same city. The person was taken from home at night to a quarantine camp. They were put on a bus without any documents provided and no information about where they were headed. Police or health workers forcibly breaking into residents' houses is not uncommon in China. In Liaoyang City, security camera footage shows local police breaking into a man's home and beating him in front of his children. It was said that this man was complaining on WeChat about the local COVID policy. Another video posted on November 30th, hundreds of people are seen lining up to enter a quarantine camp in Guangzhou City. A video from Lanzhou City shows locals there set one of the camps on fire. Other videos circulating online show local authorities locking fire exits of residential buildings. While the Chinese Communist regime continues to enforce its strict zero-COVID policy, the U.S. Embassy in Beijing is urging Americans not to travel to China or within China. The advisory warned that U.S. citizens could be stranded in quarantines and lockdowns and that access to essentials like food, water and medicine could be cut off. The embassy recently recommended that Americans keep two weeks of emergency supplies on hand and return to the U.S. if they are concerned for their safety. And coming up, Tesla unveils its new battery-powered semi at the company's Nevada plant. Hear what the company says about the truck's performance right after the break. The Biden administration has approved another multi-million dollar sale of missiles to Finland. The possible $380 million sale consists of Stinger anti-aircraft, shoulder-fired missiles and related equipment. This follows the administration's Monday approval of a separate $323 million arms sales to Finland. Both deals come as Finland, with share, which shares a border with Russia, seeks to join NATO. Finland and Sweden both announced their intention to join NATO in May after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A top EU official warned Twitter owner Elon Musk on Wednesday, saying the social media platform must take significant steps to comply with EU content moderation laws. They added that European officials will be monitoring closely for compliance. And today's Daniel Monahan has the story. EU digital chief Thierry Breton says Twitter has huge work ahead to meet its obligations under the Digital Services Act, Europe's new platform regulation. Breton says that Twitter will have to implement transparent user policies and significantly reinforce content moderation. Musk has agreed to let EU officials stress test the social media platform for compliance with the Digital Services Act early next year. Twitter has also faced troubles at home. However, critics are drawing attention to what seems to be a double standard in how companies are treated. NSC coordinator for strategic communications John Kirby was questioned on Apple restricting its airdrop function in China, which protesters used to communicate. A journalist asked for a comment on Apple allegedly aiding the CCP to keep its people under control. He responded that Apple is a private company that has to make decisions on its own. The journalist pointed out that Twitter is also a private company. Here's White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre on the subject of Twitter. Again, we're all keeping a close eye on this. We're all uh, uh, monitoring uh, what's, what's currently uh, occurring. Kirby was pressed on Apple's suspected support of the Chinese government. Uh, they should have to speak to that, but uh, we, you know, we're not, we can't and we aren't in the business of, of telling private companies how to, to execute uh, their, their initiatives. Yeah, Meanwhile, Senator Tom Cotton spoke on another double standard, TikTok, which even has powerful former members of government working on its staff. Lobbyists working for TikTok include former Republican Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott, former Senator John Burrow, and former Congressman Jeff Dunham and Barton Gordon. 
Cotton called TikTok a kind of digital fentanyl or Trojan horse on the phones of America's youth. Here's Cotton on Fox News. It is part of its massive surveillance network that is going to give access to hundreds of millions of Americans' phones going for today and going forward. He said those former government members should know better than to lobby for a company that is directed by the CCP. He called for such lobbyists to be registered as foreign agents. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Tesla CEO Elon Musk delivered the company's first heavy-duty semi yesterday to PepsiCo. Musk appeared on stage at Tesla's Nevada plant, saying the battery-powered truck would outperform existing diesel models of the same range. He added that the semi uses regenerative braking to improve efficiency. Musk did not outline updated forecasts for the cargo hauling truck's pricing or production plans. Tesla using the trucks continuously day and night uh, between um, here and Fremont and, and back again uh, is, is going to be uh, it is an, a great test of the vehicle uh, and will give us a great feedback loop for continuing to improve the product. PepsiCo completed its first cargo run with the truck. It ordered 100 trucks in 2017. Other companies that ordered the semi were Anheuser-Busch, UPS and Walmart. Up next, a psychiatrist who says by sharing his lessons battling depression, he hasn't lost one patient in 30 years. His life lessons are after the break. Mark Golston used to suffer from depression. After he almost dropped out of medical school twice, he came across something that he says helped him take back control of his life. Now he's a psychiatrist himself and says he hasn't lost one patient to suicide in the last 30 years. Joining me now is Dr. Mark Golston. He is a psychiatrist and the executive producer of the film What I Wish My Parents Knew. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Evelyn. So, executive producer, coach to entrepreneurs, to CEOs, you are a professor at UCLA and you authored four books, if I'm correct, among many, many other things that you're doing. Um, you're also working in suicide prevention, of course, but you were in a very difficult place yourself while in medical school, I understand. So, can you please start by telling me how that time was for you? Well, what happened in medical school is I, I dropped out of medical school twice and, and graduated. I don't know anyone who did that. And I think I dropped out because I had untreated depression. And the second time I dropped out, they wanted to kick me out because they were losing money. And then the dean of students uh, hit me with what I call the trifecta of hope. The trifecta of hope. And basically uh, what he said is, uh, you didn't mess up because you're passing everything, but you are messed up. Uh, but uh, if you get unmessed up, I think the school would be glad they gave you a second chance. And then here was the first leg of the trifecta of hope. He said, and even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything with the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you. Mm. Which meant he had, he had unconditional love for me. And, then, and then, then the second leg of it was he said, uh, uh, you have something uh, that the world needs and you won't know it till you're 35, but you have to make it till you're 35. So he saw a future for me that I didn't see. That's the second part of the trifecta. And finally, he looked at me and he said, you deserve to be on this planet and you're gonna let me help you. And he stood up to the medical school and said, we're giving this one a, sec this, this one a second chance. And I just paid that forward afterwards. Uh, so I, I took a year off, went to a psychiatric foundation and saw that I had some sort of talent. And then I came back, finished medical school, finished uh, training in psychiatry at UCLA. And one of my focuses was suicide prevention. And I just gave to my patients what the Dean of Students gave to me and none of them died by suicide in over 30 years. I wanna go into that and unpack a little bit later but first I want to you know you touched on it about um, how you dropped out twice and I want to know how exactly mental health affected that and I mean to help people understand 
Is there a good way you can describe what depression felt to you, um, felt like to you at that time? Um, y you feel, uh, you feel useless. You feel worthless. And, and I had parents who grew up in the depression and so their values were, and this may be people in an Asian audience may understand this, you're only worth what you can do. And if you can't do anything, you're not worth anything. And so that's how I was evaluating myself. But the dean of students saw something in me that I didn't see, uh, which had nothing to do with what I was able to do. I guess he saw some goodness or something in me that he thought the world needed. I want to know, you, you mentioned um, that you haven't lost your patience to suicide in 30 years. Why do you think um, there is a streak of success? What do you owe that to? Well, I think what happened is after I finished uh, training uh, at UCLA, I, I was fortunate because a fellowship I was supposed to go into uh, was canceled. So I just went out there and decided to be to practice. And one of my mentors was one of the pioneers in suicide prevention. And it was a fortunate mis mishap for me because when I sat with patients and I looked into their eyes, uh, I could see that what they were saying to me with their eyes, not their voice, but with their eyes was, you're checking boxes and I'm running out of time. So I let go of the boxes. And I started to listen into people for their hurt, their fear that they couldn't take it much longer, their anger that people were throwing things at them and making them feel like they were being stubborn when really they were depressed. It creates a space where they feel safe, not judged, and they can lean into it. I remember I asked one of my patients, what helped? You know, what helps in your seeing me? I'm just curious. And he said, "Every to everybody else in my life, I'm a burden. I scare my parents. My brothers and sisters think I'm being manipulative, which I am. And, and my life is a burden to me. So I just thought, why don't I just take the burden off of everyone and end it all? And he said, when I started seeing you, you were glad to see me. And I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to follow treatment. He said, Dr. Goulston, I thought you were crazy <laughs> that you were glad to see me. But if you can recall, Evelyn, that's what happened with the dean of students. He was, he, he was, he saw a future for me where I didn't have to do anything. I just had to be, I guess, kind and good. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark Goulston. That was very interesting. I could chat with you all day, but uh, we have to end it here, unfortunately. So thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. He actually also said that it helps to just be vulnerable and tell people how you really feel, and that will let the people in your life connect with you better. Well, yeah, he is the professional. And if you or someone you know may be struggling with suicidal thoughts, please stay in touch with the people around you and share your feelings. You can always also call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. That's right, and that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you. Before you go, you can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning@entity.com as usual. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.